Voices from Oxford today is talking to a very distinguished chemist in the University of Oxford, Professor Hagen Bailey. And Professor Bailey, in addition to his important work on chemistry, also has a very interdisciplinary team, and we're going to talk about some of that. So, Hagen, you are a chemist in origin, am I correct? That's correct yes. yes. But what you're actually working on are molecules that appear in the cells of our body. Is that That's roughly right. right? So we work on proteins that are in the membranes of our cells. Now, to get the general audience understanding what we're talking about here, all the cells of our body, the trillions of cells, have got a membrane around them. Right, so our, our cells need to keep the good things in and keep yes. the bad things out and, and they have to have proteins in those membranes that will exchange molecules between the outside world and the inside of the cell. So we call these transporters or channels, that's channels, roughly right pores, isn't it? transporters yes. and we're, we're particularly interested in protein pores. Yes. Now, don't think people will fully understand that. So a pore, you've got a membrane like that and it's actually a, a double layer, isn't it? That's correct. Yes. So you've got a double layer of fatty substance and you've got a protein sitting in it. Why does it sit there? So cells have uh, membranes, yes. uh, as you pointed out. These membranes are made of lipid molecules. So, so this is a very greasy layer that They're surrounds the, the cell. Molecules. That's yes. right. Yes. And the cells have to um, secrete molecules they don't want and they have to bring in molecules that they do want right. and they have proteins called transporters and channels um, to do that and um, there's another class of proteins called protein pores which form larger holes in membranes yes. and these are often secreted by bacteria or other pathogens right. to make holes in the target cells and, and kill those cells. So this is the mechanism by which a bacteria damages us? One of the mechanisms. One of the mechanisms, yes, yes indeed. Does your work relate to ways in which we can deal with that problem or not? Yeah, in some ways. We we focus on the basic science of wh what are the structures of these pores, right. um, how do they assemble and what is their function. And by understanding that, we can develop molecules that, for example, will block these pores okay. and uh, can act to inactivate them or kill various right. bacteria. But right. that's not the main focus no, no, of, of our lab. Yes, yes. Now, as I understand it, you're also now focused on ways in which you can do something very clever by forming little micro droplets. Can you? Tell well, us that's about a that. new venture for the lab, and that yes. um, evolved from our earlier work. So our initial work on membrane pores was the, the basic science to really understand right. how these work in the cell. Yes. Uh, from that, we moved on to think about how these might be applied in biotechnology so we can so-called engineer these protein pores, change their properties either by using genetics or by using chemistry right. um, and convert them, for example, into sensors. So we, in the early days, we made lots of um, sensors from these pores that can be used to detect um, a wide variety of substances at the single molecule level. This in turn evolved into um, a new method for, for DNA sequencing that was taken up by um, Oxford Nanopore, which is an right. Oxford uh, spin-out company. Right. Once they got going, um, they developed very quickly, so we had to think of new things to do it in our own lab. Yes. And uh, we'd been very interested in miniaturizing the measurements of currents that flow through the protein pores, which right. is basically the way that we use them uh, as sensors. Yes. So instead of using large chambers with these molecules in between them, we developed a system where we could use very small water droplets with a lipid bilayer, the same as would yes. be in the membrane of a cell, between yes. the two droplets, um, insert one of these proteins into them and measure the current through that protein. Okay, so you've got two droplets. Right. Uh, and they've got a, a single membrane around them, haven't that's they? Correct. Yes. Do you bring them together and that forms this double protein, a uh, double lipid layer yeah. that we talked about earlier on, right. as that occurs naturally in cells, but you're creating that by just bringing two droplets together. Right. That's roughly right. Now, 
if I put some of the right proteins in this droplet, how does it know to get to the well, cell membrane? Well, these proteins really actually want to be in cell membranes, so that their oh. membrane proteins are actually not very happy in water. No. Sometimes no. we have a little bit of detergent there, the same kind of substance that you'd use yes. to clean your clothes to, yes. to keep them in the water, yes. but they will spontaneously, they will spontaneously partition or membrane. jump into the membranes. So we really yeah. don't. That's a chemistry fact, isn't it? Is that yeah. roughly right? Yeah. So in that sense, that particular aspect of biology, why do the proteins that form channels and membranes go to the membrane, that's solved in the sense that you, once you know the chemistry of it, you know why it goes to the membrane. Yeah. Is that roughly yeah, right? Yes. True. Yes. So what are you using this technique for, Hagen? The well, so initially we were using these to, to miniaturize so-called current recordings through the pore. We can right. measure... Measuring electric current electric going through, right. yes. And yes. so that enabled us to uh, reduce the volumes that we were using by a factor of 10,000 or so. So we could use right. very rare proteins and very expensive oh. reagents in our experiments. In very tiny amounts. Right. <coughs> yes. But yes. it occurred to us at the time that if we could just join two droplets together, yes. why couldn't we join um, four or ten or a thousand or ten thousand? Right. And that's where um, this 3D printing technique for printing uh, tissue-like materials, that's um, how it really evolved in the lab. In the lab, one thing usually evolves to another. It's, yes. it's not usually an idea that comes out of the blue. So that, that's really where that came from. Now, there you've lost me a little bit. You might have lost your audience to 3D printing. Can you tell us what you're actually doing there? Okay, so um, I think many people will be uh, familiar with 3D printers that right. print plastic. Yes. So they basically yes. um, extrude plastic like toothpaste from a tube or in little blobs and um, the um, tube that the plastic is emerging from um, can just move over the surface so, right. so you can produce patterns yes. and it can also uh, build up layers of material. Indeed, yes. So instead of doing that we print very very tiny aqueous droplets so these would be um, in a picoliter volume, so they'd be a, a billionth of the, the, the yes. volume. And they're about the size of cells themselves, yes. a little bit bigger. So you won't see them with a naked eye? No, you yeah. won't see these, yeah. Yes. So, yes. so we can print these in a predetermined three-dimensional pattern, right. okay. and we can make materials that resemble um, tissues. So we're, we're interested um, in using these tissue-like materials in medicine, um, but furthermore, we can actually encapsulate cells in these droplets. So this is a method for actually printing cells in three dimensions right. as well. This is un unthinkable. So, so it's we extraordinary. can print at the, at the simple end of things. We can yes. print um, materials that would resemble small yes. tumors yes. and right. and maybe test drugs on them. Um, in the future, we may be able to print pieces of material that could, for example, be used to repair a damaged heart. That would be our so long-term goal. You think I can sit at a keyboard, controlling my 3D printer, and say, I want to print a cancer cell, I want to print a heart cell. That's conceivable? Exactly, sure. exactly. And I think in the long term, maybe a few decades ahead, um, surgeons may be ha able to have these printers actually in the operating theater right. so they can print um, uh, pieces of tissue to use in surgery basically on the spot. Yes. Well, Hagen, this almost sounds like science fiction, but you're saying it's here now and can be done. <laughs> Extraordinary. Well, the beginnings are here, the beginnings and, and, are here. and I think yes. uh, many of these things, yes, can be done yeah. in the lab. Yes. It, of course, it takes <coughs> years to transfer them um, to, course, to make them practicable. Yes. But you've already shown the way to do that with your formation of Nanopore. So, yeah. so Oxford Nanopore really started as a company um, that uh, was going to do so-called stochastic sensing, that means sensing of yes. individual molecules, yes. and we'd already shown that we could detect metals, drug molecules, cellular materials like DNA and proteins and so on, um, but very quickly the uh, company t 
took up this idea of single molecule DNA sequencing right. and over the last, it's taken a while, over the last 10 years they've developed that yeah. in, again into a practical proposition. So and furthermore, the sequencer that they developed is about the size of a cell phone, so this is quite revolutionary. Most, most um, DNA sequences are really huge yeah, and, huge and you, you simply yes. just can't yes. move them around. So you have the experience of bringing what looks like initially basic science right out into application in the world at large. Yeah, and it's been very interesting. I think yeah. often people in the lab are opportunistic. They look for problems that can be solved. Um, when you take this into industry, getting that last 5% of the way yes. can be very, very difficult indeed. And that's what Oxford Nanopore has done over yeah. the last right. decade or so. Well, Professor Hagen Bailey, thank you very much indeed for talking to Voices from Oxford about some absolutely fascinating work. Um, wish you luck in making sure that in the future those surgeons can go to the keyboard and <laughs> generate the cells they need. Right. Thank you very much for talking to us. Dennis, thank okay. you very much. Thank you.